Good evening, MedHead. So good to have you here tonight talking about a healthcare triage episode, one of my favorite YouTube channels. If you have not seen healthcare triage, it's, it's one of the channels that's a part of the D, DFTBA group of channels uh, that is produced by Hank and John Green, the, the vlog brothers on YouTube, and also who put on VidCon, which I attended the last weekend. They have a channel called Healthcare Triage out of Indianapolis that goes over healthcare policy in great detail with Dr. Aaron Carroll, a pediatrician and academician in Indianapolis, and I am a fan of it. So I thought that would be a great sort of um, impetus for us to jump off from to talk about the exact same topic as the most recent video, which was deprescribing. So I'm going to jump into that topic at uh, two minutes into this video, but between now and then I'm going to be greeting people as they come in, like McNuggs. Hey Doc, yeah, good to have you here. We're glad to have you join us for talking about deprescribing. And we welcome anybody else coming in. Uh, go ahead and comment. I may not comment on your comment, but please put it in anyway, and you guys can actually uh, go back and forth uh, with discussion as we talk about deprescribing or taking away prescriptions. And we also will have super chat available, so that is a way that you can break in if you really need to get whatever you're saying through. You just hit that little dollar sign and put an amount, and you will get recognized if you do that. Yes, Mama Three Monkeys. Welcome back. Good evening to you also. Jeannie Cooley. Hi, Jeannie from Virginia. And Claire and Barney Dog. Home in, not, or you are home in San Dinas. And Nanda Rocks. Good evening, Doctor. Christina Hartman. Hi, Doc. Hi, Christina. Teresa D. Evening all. Evening, Chris, uh, Teresa. Cheryl McNutt. Hey, Doctor. Hey, Cheryl. And Maya Farmer. Hello. Hello, Maya. And Nanda Rocks. Hello, everyone. So, thank you all for coming. And hi, Ashley Shirk also. So, I'm going to uh, transition now to talking about the topic, which was healthcare on healthcare triage, which was deprescribing, and another term that would go along with that that I should probably put in the description and in the uh, tags for this video would be polypharmacy, too many medications. Now, Dr. Carroll makes mention of studies in the last decade, but if you go back two decades, you can see some work by John Morley in St. Louis and others on the very issue of polypharmacy where they would find actual improvement in the VA that they were working at when they would have a medication reduction clinic. This was in the late 1990s, so nearly 20 years ago, some work was being done that was early in this field uh, compared to some of the stuff mentioned on healthcare triage. But thankfully, we have more information, newer information, uh, information with a larger power about the benefit of getting people off the medicine. As Dr. Carroll points out, we need more. There's, there, there's little as far as the big scheme, um, you know, compared to other things that we know about in medicine, of the benefit of taking away medicines. But there is definitely data out there to support that there are places where it's appropriate when a patient is on a lot of medicines. And this is particularly in elderly. Uh, that's why I talk about John Morley at St. Louis University. Uh, at that time, he was working in community medicine and in geriatrics and very much working with elderly patients, finding that we could get them down on medicines. He actually had the number four medicines, which seems unbelievable when you have patients coming in, at least a lot of the patients who come in who are over age 65, which is more than half of what I see on any given day. It's age 65 and over, even though not more than half of my patients are age 65 and over, but as far as number of visits, because they come in more often, they have more medical problems, and they get more attention. So four medications, unbelievable if you think about a lot of the patients who come in, if they have uh, hypertension, if they also have with that diabetes, if they have something else going on, uh, if, if their hypertension is not controlled with one medicine. Um, and, and when I talk about this, in the back of my mind, I, I, I could probably hear some of you guys thinking, and, and my, oh, looky there, we have, we have an appearance by Lisa. I know some of you are big fans of Lisa, so Lisa, we're talking about uh, old, old patients. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Old people. Yeah, it's not adolescent medicine day. Although you're you're getting out of adolescence here, you're growing up so quick. My birthday's on Saturday. Her birthday's on Saturday, so. I'm turning eighteen. She's turning eighteen. Send all your presents to Lisa. You probably. Our address you. is. Uh, the office know. address. One two three four. Get away from me. <laughs> dot com. You creep. You creepy fan on you my dad's channel. Avenue. <laughs> sorry for the interruption. Actually, I, I probably shouldn't say sorry. They, they like seeing you. Hi, Leanne. 
Thanks for making an appearance. Sure. Okay. I think I was coming through too. And they're all saying happy birthday. Oh, she's going to pass through too. That's our anniversary. Okay. It's anniversary. Thank you. Should we tell the whole world? <laughs> okay. Sorry for the interruption. Yes. Thank you, Teresa. Very kind of you to say that. And she is. So getting back to, to where we were. on. Oh, I hope there weren't any super chats uh, while they were passing through. I don't think there were. And I know that somebody would tell me if there were. Okay. Thank you. Well, you guys have been talking there. Um, but staying on the topic here. And I do encourage you to use the link in the description. It's already there. Before I started this, I had the link to the healthcare triage on deprescribing, which is, is Dr. Aaron Carroll's term that he's using for this. Yes, I'll tell her that you said hi, Teresa. Thank you. Uh, so here's what's going on. He, he talks a little bit in his video about the data that shows that the more medications, the more potential for adverse effects. It can be interactions. It can be with blood pressure medicines, uh, blood pressure getting too low. He did point out, as I do quite often, benzodiazepines and sleep medications, which are on Beer's criteria. He didn't mention Beer's criteria. Beer's criteria is a list of medications that people over age 65 um, to put it broadly, shouldn't be on. Now, that's a blanket statement you probably shouldn't make. Uh, we, we try to avoid generalizations. But if you were to make a generalization about medicines that people over 65 shouldn't be on, Beer's List has that list of medications because it puts them at risk for adverse events, like falls, benzodiazepines, and sleep aids. We know do that. We know that having uh, too much uh, medication for controlling blood pressure, and that's why we actually have, under something called JNC8, a recommendation to allow patients' blood pressure to be a little bit higher at age 60 and older than we have for younger than age 60, where we say use medication to get it down, get their blood pressure down under 140 systolic, 90 diastolic. At age 60, uh, the JNC8, which is not universal, but it's what uh, our practice is going by, allows that blood pressure to kind of ride up to 150 systolic as long as they don't have a problem like diabetes or kidney disease or uh, you know, very fragile as far as risk for stroke with, with hypertension. Um, heart disease oftentimes will, will have reasons for using beta blockers to try to get their, their blood pressure lower. Uh, we are doing that in our office. We are looking at medication lists. We are asking the question, what can be taken away and possibly improve a patient's outcome? Uh, when patients come in from the hospital, we actually have a visit where we look at and reconcile the new medications they have from that visit with the list we have. We don't necessarily have that for when they go to a specialist, though, and we need to. We need to specifically see a patient when they come back from a specialist with the mindset of the specialist is prescribing medicines according to their professional society's recommendations for whatever they're treating. Uh, and that's really just adding on medications. It's our job as family medicine to look at the list as a total list, not just the medicines of a, special, a certain specialty, and see if, as a whole, maybe the patient benefits from taking away rather than maintaining that big, long list, or in some cases, considering adding medications. That, that's kind of the default when a patient comes in, I'll admit it, is they, they have something, and how can you make them better? Oh, I can write a prescription. Well, a lot of times there's better things than writing prescriptions. I almost spoke about this when Lisa came into the, the video, and that is... For example, with blood pressure, diabetes, lifestyle changes. So many Americans, uh, compared to less developed countries, uh, do not have a healthy lifestyle as far as what they're putting in their body and exercise or fitness. And that can take away a lot of problems. We do on occasion have a patient that gets motivated enough that through weight loss, through eating differently, and also improving their fitness with exercise, they can actually get rid of a diagnosis of hypertension or diabetes. They get cured. It's miraculous. You know, people are looking for miracles. I hear this conversation. I see it when a patient actually gets motivated to eat sensibly and to get regular exercise and uh, lowers their risk for heart attack or stroke. It's hard to see it as miraculous when they're not having a heart attack or stroke because you don't see that. You see when people do, but when somebody doesn't, you don't, it doesn't register. There, it's an absence of something. So many things in medicine are improving people's lives by having an absence of something that otherwise may occur. 
And you can't know in any one individual whether that's going to happen or not. A lot of the data that goes behind recommendations for lifestyle changes and avoiding things. Oh, Lindsay Antoine's here. Problem is people looking for an effort-free miracle. Yes, Lindsay Antoine, like the patient who said to me, just give me a pill. Oh, Audrey Bunch is here too. How can our lifestyle change our blood pressure? For example, is it diet activity or both? Okay, Audrey, uh, we would direct you to the video on DASH, D-A-S-H, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And it talks about how we do that. We're not going to do the take up that time here with the details of DASH or just Google DASH and hypertension. Notice I don't say DASH diet because dietary is in the acronym DASH. Anyway, I won't, I won't talk about that anymore. So uh, we also have Arminita of Rise. How to reduce stress? Yes, that's another thing. We in the middle of this great discussion, do we? Yes, I see your comments about me being offline. That's why I'm back now. Uh, and you guys didn't miss anything. I'm starting right back at the reason we are not... It's not that we're withholding people's uh, notes to get them out of work. It's that we're being very specific because when you take patients out of the workplace, they are less likely to end up being able to get back in it and functional than if you keep them there. Now that's a generalization and there's patients who generally or uh, genuinely are completely disabled for a period of time or need to be out of the workplace. I'm not talking about those very few unique situations that apparently a lot of patients think they're in when they're not. Uh, but most people what we need to do is write very specific recommendations for what they can and can't do based on testing them. You know, can you lift this much? Can you walk this long? Can you sit this long? Those sort of questions. And there's answers to these questions. And a lot of this comes from thinking, okay, so if you're not at work, what are the activities you're doing at home? We will have employers come to us and tell us, please send the patient back because rather than pay out disability, we would love to pay them their regular pay to have them sit and answer a phone instead of dig a ditch. That's a, a you know a big, very specific example that's probably not going to happen, but there are situations like that where they say, no, there is no light duty. I've had patients tell me, no, there is no light duty. And, and there actually is when, when it comes around to it and we actually write the recommendations. Employers can be very creative when they don't want to pay for disability and they'd rather actually get some benefit to the company rather than not. I guess I'm a little sympathetic to that as a, as a small business owner, but also with the data that we see with when you write for disability and get people out of the workplace, um, it's harder for them to get back. And the longer they're out, the less likely they are to get back in. So it's actually better for ability to stay in the workplace in a lot of situations. So I, I'm sorry I'm ignoring a lot of the, uh, the stream of, of comments there. I certainly will... Uh, uh, respond to super chats. Uh, let's see here. Pam says, Dr. Ron made it through back surgery. Oh, good. Spent eight days in ICU. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, in the trolley. And Armanita is smiling. Marilo Camino, doctor in Brazil. Don't speak English, but I love your channel. Well, thank you, Marilo. And thank you for coming up the way you put it in English because I'm not so good with the Portuguese. Okay. I, don't, I just want to have that discussion about de-prescribing. I encourage all of you to use the link and to discover the channel Healthcare Triage. I will say this, sometimes it, it's, it's a bit thick with the jargon. Uh, it really seems to be written at, uh, written for people who, and it's written by Dr. Carroll, who have a knowledge already of medical policy or healthcare policy. I say that because I, I'm a medical doctor and have been for decades, and when I watch it, uh, sometimes the information is going so fast that I'm not able to keep up with what he's talking about. But it's very important right now to get uh, a physician's interpretation of what's going on in healthcare policy with um, our future of healthcare currently right this week being uh, worked on and possibly voted on. So uh, that is an excellent source of information. I will try to do my best to digest what he presents and combine it with my own clinical experience to give you uh, a little uh, lower level discussion because he really he, he really talks at the policy level. He's he's an academician. And he he's reading those journals and, and in those conversations. Whereas I'm more uh, working with patients, trying to trying to make them better. He is too, but uh, at a different place within the healthcare system as far as policy is concerned. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I do encourage you again to check out Healthcare Triage channel, one of the SciShow channels, or the same network that SciShow's in. You know, I like that channel too. And do keep watching our videos. We have one coming out at four o'clock tomorrow. And I believe it's another ear cleaning for those of you who really love those. 
Until next time, this is Dr. Mark Vaughn telling all of you to stay in good health.